Okay, I'd like to welcome all participants. Professor Kitlin, Mr. Moravets, distinguished guests, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce Administrators, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special lecture on peace and economic development in the age of globalization. It is a great honor for the university to host such a special speech given by the renowned Nobel laureate. And this is the second event after the first one held right here at the university on November 13, 2007. And in a few minutes, we will start the welcome remark with Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairung Road, the Vice President for Research. May I call upon Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairung Road, the Vice President for Research, to give a welcome speech about this remarkable event. Professor Kitlin, Mr. Molowes, UTCC administrators, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I welcome all of you to our sec sec second special lecture of this academic year co-organized by the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation. This special lecture is held to commemorate the 45th anniversary of University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and to cooperate with the International Peace Foundation in building up of a culture of peace which can only be achieved through broad international cooperation among higher education institutions themselves by creating alliances, partnerships with a broad range of institutions, organizations, educationalists, and researchers, as well as with civil society at large. The lecture on peace and economic development in the age of globalization will eventually provide a forum for interested participants to exchange ideas and cooperation regarding the issue on global peace and economy. Through Professor Kidland's insight into driving forces behind business cycles and the time consistency of economic policy, I believe that his lecture will be an effective inspiration for all parties concerned to bring about peace and economic development in today's world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Professor Dr. Sawni Tairung Road. At this auspicious moment, I would like to invite Mr. Uwe Moraves, Chairman of the Board of Directors International Peace Foundation, to, to deliver his opening address. And welcome to the first ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. And I would like to thank the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and its president, Dr. Chiradet Ausowat, for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2007, Bridges is being continuously held in Thailand and the Philippines until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The first ASEAN series of bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 250 bridges events which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand between November 2003 and April 2005. Bridges has been established as an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary 
platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education for all people. The International Peace Foundation has no concept for peace and no fixed solution how to achieve peace, but we believe that the first step towards peace is dialogue and the first step towards dialogue is respect. The International Peace Foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet. People from all walks of life. People who speak different languages, even if they speak the same. As politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders, another one than scientists, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answers and solutions, how to solve problems, how to, how to achieve peace, though the quest for peace lies in the art to pose the right questions. The International Peace Foundation believes that the interconnected problems of our world today cannot be solved only by politicians, only by business, only by scientists, or by religion alone, but by working together. In the Bridges event series, people from all walks of life meet in a multidisciplinary program to find creative solutions to solve problems and to achieve peace. Peace within ourselves, within our family, within social structures, peace with nature and the environment, peace between nations, cultures and religions. Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as a single conference, but as a series of events over the period of six months in which Nobel laureates from all fields build bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few, but which needs the participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet can international understanding be achieved and problems com commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways, and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. May I now invite you to listen to and share your views with Professor Finn Kidland, the 2004 Nobel Laureate for Economics, who has agreed to come to Thailand to help build bridges. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution. A warm welcome, Professor Kidland. Thank you very much, Mr. Uwe. Uh, now it's, the, it's time for the highlight of the event. May I introduce you a little bit before you give the keynote speech? Today I have the singular honor and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, who is a Norwegian economist. He earned a Bachelor Degree of Science from the Norwegian School of Economics in 1968 and a PhD in economics from Carnegie Mellon in 1973. Currently, Professor Kitlin is the Henley Professor of Economics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He also holds the Richard P. Simmons Distinguished Professorship at the Tepper School of Business of Carnegie Mellon University. And for his award and honors, there are plenty of them, may I? introduce like only a couple. Uh, Alexander Henderson Award, Carnegie Mellon, 1973. Bank of Sweden Prize in Economic Science in memory of Alfred Nobel, 2004. And for his teaching and research interests, Professor Kitlin's area of expertise are economics in general and political economy. His main areas of teaching and interest are business cycles, monetary and fiscal policy, and labor economics. And you'll find that we see that our keynote speaker is an active researcher. I have, uh, I have read 
your autobiography, and it's some kind of very long. And I find that he frequently publishes analytical reports with catchy names like theory ahead of business cycle measurement on time to build and aggregate fluctuations. It's no doubt that he befits Nobel Prize winner. That is, on 11 October 2004, the Royal Swedish Academy of Science announced that Professor Frind E. Kittland of Norway and Edward C. Plescott of the United States of America have been awarded the Nobel Prize for their contributions to dynamic macroeconomics, the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycles. And his today talk, as you know, it will be on peace and economic development in the age of globalization. Ladies and gentlemen, please all welcome 2004 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Fint E. Kitlin. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Uh, first, I'd like to say, say how happy Tanya and I have been to be in uh, Bangkok for since Thursday. We have, we've had a wonderful time. Uh, and I, of course, I thank the university for contributing to putting this together, and, and uh, Uber Moravets for inviting me. Uh, of course, you all should know that if Tanya hadn't agreed to come, then I wouldn't have been here. So uh, she's, I have as a rule, I don't tell outside the continent of North America unless Tanya comes along. So my beautiful and wonderful wife is right over here. Um, so the, um, the idea that there is a connection between peace and ec economic development is one that I think many would uh, agree with. Uh, personally, I believe strongly that deficient economic development often comes in the way of peace. Um, an example of someone very much into the peace effort who apparently thinks the same way is Ilya Weissel, the uh, Peace Prize winner from a number of years ago. He has invited me to come to his annual conference now three years uh, in a row. The fourth conference will take place in, as always, in Petra, Jordan. It will take place in June. And uh, this is a conference primarily of Nobel laureates from different areas, but Ilya Vassell is smart enough to invite some other uh, people to come along, and uh, usually experts in, in their field or uh, government official and so, and so on. Uh, these are conferences to think about how to save the world or how to build a uh, better world. And, and uh, in these conferences, we're all divided into four groups. And one of the groups has always been the group discussing ec economic development. Uh, I admit that I didn't work so, so um, closely in that area before, and it's partly through the participation in, in Elia Weissel's conferences that my interest in this area really took hold. Of course, uh, some of my work has, has been related to economic development, and uh, most of, much of what I'll say today is connected somehow to my, to my research. I uh, always get nervous if, I, if I'm asked to talk about something that's not related to my research, and so uh, I'll, I'll continue that tradition. Now, before I really get into the subject, I want to sh show you some uh, charts. Here's a uh, seemingly random collection of uh, nations. Uh, describing real GDP per capita since 1950, from 1950 to uh, about 2005. Um, the, uh, these are real magnitudes. They're taken from the world uh, pen tables, uh, as they're called. Uh, there's always some issue about how to convert 
um, GDP in different countries to, uh, to, uh, to, to measurements that are comparable. Uh, but, but these have been converted using uh, uh, purchasing power parity uh, translations. Uh, so, uh, so you see one of probably the leading country in terms of, uh, of uh, growing GDP per capita is, is at the top of this picture, the United States. Then there's uh, Hong Kong, Canada. Um, I even have, I believe, uh, Thailand in this uh, picture. Uh, I'm standing a little to the side, so I can't quite, maybe I'll stand here now. Uh, we do have Thailand here, and uh, um, that will be this curve. Um, I guess you're all familiar with the, I the idea that uh, things look very uh, promising uh, on a path that maybe should have gone like this, but then 1997 came, and uh, am I in your way? Uh, and. Uh, and there was a decline, and then uh, we have sort of uh, recovered now. But uh, still uh, somewhat below some of these other countries. Uh, I want you to take note of Argentina, for example. Argentina used to be one of the most well-to-do countries in the world. Argentina has really, uh, really slowed down compared to the other countries. One thing about this picture is um, you should, there's nothing uh, particularly spectacular about the fact that these curves are getting steeper and steeper. That's just a reflection of when a 5% uh, uh, increase here when you're uh, starting from a much higher base is going to be a larger distance than 5% here. Um, there is a different way to uh, show um, growth pictures that sometimes are more revealing and, and, and that's to put put them in proportional scale to take the logarithm at first uh, because then the constant growth rate will show up in the picture as a straight line. Here a constant growth rate uh, gets steeper and steeper. Uh, but, but for my purpose here in the beginning as kind of motivation, uh, I, I want to be able to compare these, uh, these magnitude, the, the uh, dollar values of real GDP per capita and you see the scale goes from zero to 40,000 in, uh, in uh, and that would be at, as of dollars at the end of the sample. Um, here's a picture of European countries. Um, these, are, these grow quite smoothly and the rates of growth are not that different. There are, there, traditionally there were some laggards such as among, among these particular eight countries, um, Greece and Spain used to be lag behind, but they've started to catch up. A and the really, the, the nation that I really want you to, to, to notice, uh, we have Ireland here, they used to be right in there with Greece and Spain. Look at how it's really uh, grown dramatically, dramatically since 1990 and uh, and it's caught up with uh, Denmark and uh, Germany, France, the United Kingdom. It's, it's up there at the top. And uh, experiences like that or n natural experiments almost are very, very valuable to economists and, uh, and the idea we, you can learn a lot from it. Now, I'll show you another uh, set of countries. The first thing to... Uh, make a note of is in both of the first two pictures the scale goes from zero to forty thousand dollars. This picture goes from zero to three thousand dollars. So uh, back in these pictures we've been talking about from here to here. Nothing up here. Well these are these are very uh, depressing uh, pictures and um, one of the points to make in, in the context of my talk today is uh, we all know that these, these, many of these countries are characterized by unrest of different sorts. And, uh, and whether, 
whether one causes the other, I mean, is it a lack of economic development or that causes unrest or unrest that causes lack of e um, economic development? That's not so always so easy to, uh, to establish, but the fact is these, these countries have not done very well and uh, not just in, in terms of being very low in levels, but, but look at how, how volatile their uh, GDP per capita is. Some countries are doing reasonably well uh, by comparison. For example, uh, I guess, guess the one that most reliably has been growing is Lesotho. And uh, Lesotho is sort of an interesting country because it's sitting there right, it's a small country in the middle of South Africa. And uh, I mean, its entire border is with South Africa. Uh, many of their, peop their people work in South Africa. So this, uh, this Lesotho is, a, is an example macroeconomists use um, to, sh to show the difference between GDP per capita and gross national income per capita. For the United States, for example, they're virtually identical. And for many countries, they're very similar. For Lesotho, they're qu quite different because so many of their workers go to South of Africa and work and then uh, come back uh, with, their, with their income. Uh, so in th if I had drawn a picture of income per capita, probably Lesotho would, uh, would, have, uh, would have been uh, quite a bit higher. But some of these countries are, uh, are doing very, very poorly. Republic of Congo, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. Um, I brought this picture before the recent unrest in Chad, uh, and so uh, you all heard uh, that there's trouble in Chad these days. Chad is uh, is right here, and um, uh, oh, I one thing I now realize I forgot in the previous picture. One uh, one of the countries I have the yellow one is um, is Afghanistan. Afghanistan isn't doing very well. Um, so the these three pictures were meant to be sort of mo motivational. And let me just give a quick overview of my talk. I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the modern framework of macroeconomics because uh, everything I do is based on, on such a framework. Um, then I'll uh, talk about an aspect that I think is important for economic development. Uh, Economic de development is a wide field. It's a, it's a very broad field and there are so many subjects I could have talked about. And uh, as I already told you, I'm going to focus on some things that I have uh, uh, focused on myself in my research. And, uh, and this is one thing uh, Prescott and I discovered uh, and, and uh, this was already mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction. I'll give you some acute examples well, first of all, I'll try to explain the uh, fundamental reason for, for what we discovered, the policy inconsistency problem. And uh, uh, it, it's not so easy to explain uh, necessarily to, uh, to uh, non-specialists because when uh, Prescott and I first presented it, everyone was cons convinced that we were wrong. Uh, and so uh, there must be uh, something a little difficult about understanding it, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll give you some cute, uh, ac acute examples, uh, maybe cute as well. Um, I'll, um, I'll talk about two countries. I happen to have studied them uh, more closely than, uh, almost as closely as, uh, as I've studied the United States and Norway, and, that's, uh, and those countries are Argentina and Ireland, uh, and I'll talk about them because I think there's so much we can learn from them. Um, Argentina, I regard as an example of uh, what happens under bad economic policies and the, and the result of uh, lack of economic development. I Ireland, an example of uh, good uh, economic policy. A and then I'll have some more general comments at the end about uh, what are the what what is it that fosters uh, economic development, or on the other hand, what, what uh, hampers economic development? Uh, so um, now, in uh, in uh, in these uh, 
two contributions that were mentioned that, uh, that were focused on by the Nobel Committee. Uh, th this, this, I think, is one of them, namely that Presque and I showed how to put people into uh, economic models. So uh, we're explicit about people's preferences over time. Uh, almost everything I know about in uh, aggregate economic, economics or macroeconomics is dynamic in nature. It's forward-looking. Uh, and, uh, and for that reason, the, uh, the preferences, are, we don't look at them just as they apply to this month or this year even, but uh, in far into the future. We're, uh, mo modern economic models are explicit about the uh, budget of the individuals or ex uh, about, I said, should say, and the uh, resources um, within which a nation must, must, uh, must live. And I, and I talk about resources in the form not just of goods and services and so on, but also time. Time is a very important uh, resource. So as I mentioned, uh, modern model economies are explicit about the uh, about people's dynamic decision problems. Uh, I, I mention this because it's kind of uh, crucial to the time consistency problem. Uh, modern um, e economies, model economies, these can be programmed into tiny, tiny uh, laptop computers, for example. Uh, they, they also contain thousands of businesses. And uh, it's, it's fair to say that you don't read any papers these days that doesn't have an explicit description of, of an aggregate production function of some sort. Some description of how you can convert capital, capital in the form of factories, machines, office buildings, and so on. Can, can convert physical capital on the one hand, uh, the workers, the labor input of the workers into output of goods and services. So that's, that's what the uh, aggregate production function uh, does in such a model. It describes in, a, um, in an amazingly uh, accurate way in terms of describing the data for, for most countries uh, how, how this goes about. And, uh, and a very important portion of the uh, product aggregate production function is a description of how nations typically become better at doing it over time, what we could call technological change. And, and this is key to, uh, this is, uh, I'll get back to this later, but this is key to, uh, to the long run growth of nations. Now, one should, one should note that when I say technological change, the, these are models uh, at relatively high level of, of abstraction and uh, there are many things that could play a role that you wouldn't ne necessarily think of as technological change. Uh, just to get, take some example, it turns out the, uh, the major oil shocks that took place in the, in the 70s and early 80s, they, they worked as if the economy had been hit by a negative technological shock. Um, there could be changes in, uh, in regulations facing the business sector, there could be uh, the government's um, provision, uh, uh, an increase in the provision of in in infrastructure would be a positive factor seen from the, uh, from the aggregate production function. Uh, I always used to mention an example uh, such as a banking panic. A banking panics, for example, uh, as we've seen uh, not that long ago in, uh, in uh, Latin America, they would be an example of, uh, of something that uh, it, it's as if there were a te negative technology shock. Uh, the, the banking banks provide a very important function as, as inter intermediators between savers and, and investors. And uh, if, the, if financial intermediation intermedi doesn't work as well, that's like throwing sand into the operation of an otherwise well-functioning economy. Uh, now, of course, uh, more recently we've seen uh, what's sometimes called the subprime uh, mortgage crisis, and, and uh, there are signs that that could work 
not, not as dramatically as a banking panic, but it could affect banks' uh, behavior at least for a while and, and, uh, and be a negative shock. Uh, just, just to mention, uh, uh, this is not so central to, uh, to my talk, but let me just say that what I personally uh, like to do is, qu is quantitative, uh, quantitative theory. And so I, I'm interested in uh, questions whose answers are, uh, should be uh, numbers, should be, uh, that should be answers in form of, uh, of numerical magnitudes. Uh, now, in order to get uh, credible or reliable uh, answers, we need, to, uh, we need to calibrate the economy, just as it's like a measur measuring device. I, if, um, if, I took, if I took a thermometer outside today and uh, it's filled with mercury, uh, the, the, um, the piece of glass is filled with mercury, I, I would uh, not trust, uh, trust it unless I knew it was calibrated to give the right answer to questions whose answer I already know. And the two key questions are, what's the, uh, where would the mercury end up in a pot of, of, uh, of water with floating ice in it? Okay, if it's a zero, then uh, that's good. That's a good start. And you stick it in a pot of boiling water, and if it says 100, then I would trust it if it says 28, if I take it outside today. A and the same way with these these uh, model economies, they they need to be calibrated to uh, to give to give the right answer to questions whose answer we already know, and then we trust all the more the um, the the, ans the questions the answers to the questions we're looking for. So uh, so I, I've talked about um, the. Um, uh, the the uh, role of or the inclusion of the household sector, basically, uh, millions of people, uh, millions of decision makers, the uh, the business sector, and uh, but we can also introduce the government, and that's really the key to much of my my talk. Uh, we can think of le le economists like to to uh, learn from very stylized examples. Uh, now, it's true that the world is not quite as simple as these stylized examples, but it's amazing how much you can learn from, from these stylized examples. So let's just imagine an uh, idealized world where we have a benign government. The, the, uh, the government has an objective that, uh, suppose it, it reflects well the welfare of people. What, uh, what, um, it reflects well the preferences uh, of the people. And the government has a budget constraint just like you and I. So, so suppose uh, the government has an unchanging budget constraint. There are no, there's no, we don't worry about change of, uh, of, uh, of the governments. Uh, a complication, of course, could be that there is a change of government and the uh, new government has a different objective. But let's, Let's save that complication for last. Let's just assume that there's, there's no change in the, uh, the objective of the government. It's, it's, uh, it's the same over time. Uh, what, what Prescott and I found was this uh, surprising thing uh, when we first saw it, but uh, uh, if you think about it, it it's, it's actually reasonably obvious. Um, this optimal government policy, suppose you, you calculate you plug in uh, a description of the economy, you plug in the uh, government's objective, its budget constraint, and then you calculate the best policy the government could follow. It turns out this policy generally is inconsistent over time, and, uh, and it requires what we could call a commitment mechanism to be implemented. Uh, otherwise, there will always be this temptation, it turns out, for the government in the future to change to a different policy than the one that was uh, calculated at time zero. A and worse than that, if they do so, the, uh, the, um, the al alternative outcomes can be very bad for the economy. Uh, the, the fundamental reason for the inconsistency is, is a little bit complicated, but 
Here, here's what's the case in a dynamic economy, a forward-looking economy. There are lots of decisions where uh, if you're rational, you, think, uh, you, you try to think far into the future. It applies to businesses thinking about expanding their capacity, building new factories, installing more modern machines, uh, thinking about whether to uh, engage in innovative activity, and so on. These are forward-looking decisions. Uh, similarly for students thinking about uh, how much education to accumulate or for uh, people to think about how, mu how much to invest in new skills for, for uh, doing work better. Uh, or or uh, suppose you were to uh, think about buying a 20-year government bond at, at a nominal interest rate. These are forward-looking decisions. Some of these decisions involve heavy expense today. The returns, the revenues, uh, are spread over uh, maybe 5, 10, 20 years into, into the future. You, you want to you wanna have some idea what the environment is going to be like in the future. And for example, in, in investment decisions, what matters to those de decisions is the revenue that uh, accrues to the uh, to the um, to the businesses after, and therefore to the owners, which are typically the households, after taxes have been paid. So uh, one of the uh, things to try to predict about the government is how, to what extent will uh, will the returns from the investment be uh, be taxed in the future. Uh, so the, um, the optimal plan for the government, planning for the day in the future, uh, takes into account the effect, the future portion of the plan, the effect it has on decisions today. A decision this, this year uh, and so on. Um, because the, uh, the, uh, the private decision makers try to anticipate uh, the future government policy. Now, so suppose we fast forward. Suppose this has been done. Calculations have been made. Policy is being implemented and so on. We fast forward, say, five years into the future. Uh, now, five years' worth of these decisions uh, among private uh, decision makers, they have already been made. And so uh, uh, the uh, key reason for this tendency to want for the government to want to change this policy, possibly, if, unless they're uh, really committed. The key reason is for the continuation of their plan, it took into account the effect it would have on decisions that have already been made. Well, those decisions have already been, they weren't, uh, hadn't been made when the plan was made, but now they have been made. Why take into account uh, the, uh, those effects any longer. And, and so there will be a, a tendency uh, for even a benign government to wish to change its policy uh, from then on. Uh, well, I, I said I would give you some uh, acute examples. A and typically, this, this problem hits hardest when, uh, when we're talking about accumulating something over time. Uh, so th the temptation could be to increase the tax on uh, physical or human capital. Uh, politicians are, are quite good at coming up with, with uh, reasons why we're in an emergency and we need additional revenue. Uh, suppose under my scenario, expecting a, a benign uh, environment for investing in, in the future, in, in future capacity, uh, business had, had t taken advantage of it and so on. Well, uh, once these factories have been, have been built, um, if the government said, oh, we fooled you, fooled you. We're, go we're going to raise the taxes on your income now, most of those factories would still keep operating. They, they, uh, they would not close down just because of this change in the government policy. Uh, the government might say, well, we're in an emergency, we're, uh, we're going to raise taxes, but we promise to uh, go back to the original taxes in the future. Yes, right. Uh, well, uh, you might be fooled once, but that's, uh, you, uh, 
uh, that, that, that trick couldn't use, be used more than once at most. Um, another example could be to uh, partially renege on, or we could, I could just as well default, say default, on government debt through surprise inflation. If the debt has been issued at, say, a normal interest rate of uh, 6%, uh, that implies a, a, a some value of, of, this, uh, of these government bonds. Uh, if at some, some point in the future, the government decides to run a surprise inflation, the, the real value, the real uh, amount of revenue the government needs to pay back those bonds, bonds would, be, uh, would drop dramatically. A and this is something that, I mean, uh, I assume these, these scenarios don't sound far-fetched because this is exactly what has happened, especially this latter example has happened many times in Latin American countries. It happened in Russia. It, it has happened uh, all over the world, basically. Some countries uh, are, uh, seem more committed not to do so, but it, 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 takes, it, takes, it takes some doing. Um, and uh, there have been examples where, um, where governments have tried special mechanisms to commit themselves for the future. A and the three examples I have here are, are mostly in the context of, of monetary policy. Uh, in the uh, 19th century, the, and somewhat into the 20th century, the, um, the gold standard was quite prevalent uh, among many countries. Uh, they, the, uh, cr the value of the currency was tied to gold as, as, a, as a way to commit uh, to increase the uh, credibility of your uh, country. Uh, Eventually, the gold standard fell apart, uh, and maybe that is a, a reflection of how difficult it is really to commit yourself in the very long run. Um, Argentina tried a currency board in which they accumulated reserves of, of US dollars, and they promised they would tie their peso to the uh, US dollars. This was done uh, when uh, Carlos Menem took over in the early 1990s after a particularly bad decade of uh, hyperinflations and, uh, and uh, big drops in economic activity, depression actually. Uh, so the currency board was tried as a, as a way to shore up the credibility of, of uh, of, uh, of Argentina and, and their currency in particular. That fell apart as well. And uh, one, one reason, without going into big detail, was they forgot, they, um, they took care of the monetary policy part, but forgot to, uh, or maybe it wasn't practical, practical to uh, shore up fiscal policy. Monetary and fiscal policy are related. And, uh, and in Argentina, uh, it was particularly difficult from a fiscal side because the provinces could borrow almost at will and, uh, of course, promise to pay back. But typically, they weren't able to pay back the loans. And then they came running to the federal government. The, uh, the debt of the federal government ballooned. And then at some point, they felt that they could not hold uh, they couldn't. They could not stick to their uh, commitment any longer. Uh, more recently, we've seen a, a surge of, or more and more central banks have um, become more independent. Bank of England, for example, became independent in 1997. Uh, one of the conclusions uh, Prescott and I drew was uh, it would be preferable for for monetary policy to be as insulated as possible from the political pressure from the, from the rest of the government. A and one way to do so is to make the central bank as, as independent as, as possible. The world differs a lot in terms of uh, how independent the central banks are. Um, United States is uh, fairly independent. Uh, the German Bundesbank was uh, was considered to be one of the most independent 
central banks in the world. Now, of course, Germany is part of the European Union, uh, and so you, the, Europe, Euro, or the European uh, uh, Central Bank uh, now conducts monetary policy for, uh, for a number of countries at, at once. Um, as I said, Bank of England realized they, uh, it was, would be good to become independent, uh, or the government did. Uh, central banks in New Zealand, uh, Scandinavia have become uh, ha have uh, become become more independent. And in practice, what they often do is uh, commit to uh, levels of inflation targeting. Uh, and in part because the idea is that it's quite tra transparent. If if they were to deviate from their commitment, it would be. Uh, this is the idea, it would be quite uh, transparent. Uh, I, I had thrown in a kind of a subtle point uh, at uh, the second one. I, is this equivalent to price level targeting? But I think maybe in the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll uh, if anyone w wants to ask me about that afterwards, I'd be glad to talk about it at length. Um, so let me now get to the uh, main driving forces of the uh, of economic growth or economic development. Well, there are basically there are two main driving forces, and this is something that comes out straight out of the aggregate production function and uh, everything we know about uh, macroeconomics. Uh, the there is the um, innovative activity, resulting making uh, nations better at producing things. Uh, with less use of input of capital and labor. Technological progress, we might call it. Um, and uh, it's something, that it's, it's a process, it's an ongoing process that results from uh, research and development, innovative activity, and so on. Uh, but, so, so that's a key factor. But we cannot live by technological change alone. We also need incentives to invest in new capital to take advantage of the innovative activities. Uh, and, and by capital, we mean, as I said, factories, machines, office buildings, anything that goes, uh, that, that goes along with the labor input to produce goods and services. Uh, Unfortunately, it's the case that many aspects of government policy may be detrimental to such growth. I always say, I often say that there's enough uncertainty in the world, the government shouldn't introduce additional unnecessary uncertainty. Uh, but unfortunately, that's, that's often what happens in many nations and that uh, such introduction of additional uncertainty uh, makes it difficult to make for the economy as a whole to make the key decisions that will uh, result in, uh, in um, insufficient economic development. So here's where I would like to use as an example the, the country that I have studied particularly closely, namely Argentina. Uh, just to to repeat, Argentina is so interesting because it used to be one of the five or six highest per capita income nations if you go back 120 years. Uh, but slowly over time, it's fallen to, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's gone from being one of the most well-developed nations to, well, it's, uh, it certainly needs, needs uh, some doing to try to catch catch up with the more well-to-do nations, and and you you remember the uh, the picture from 1950 that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. This is an, is an example of uh, uh, of a different way of expositor, expositing growth. I, in the in the first three plots I had, it was important for me to be able to compare income levels. Um, across these nations. It wasn't so important to see whether growth is picking up or not uh, and so on. Here, here uh, 
I wanted to put the numbers in a proportional scale. And uh, uh, for that reason, as uh, mathematically, I've taken log of all these numbers. Or a, a brokerage firm, if they, if they use this technique, they would say, we put the stock price in a proportional scale. And the advantage of that is that a constant growth rate is a straight line. Um, so th this straight line here, for example, represents a particular uh, constant growth rate per year. And as you can see, Argentina did, well, for, for this period as a whole, Argentina did reasonably well in, uh, I from 1950 to 1980, although you'll, if you remember my first picture, not necessarily that well compared to other nations, but by Argentine historical standards, quite well in, in, in this 30-year period. Then you see uh, a dramatic drop in GDP per working age person. Uh, one, one nice thing about log scale is I can tell, because this goes from 1.5 to 1.3 or under, I can tell right away that here we had a, over a 20% drop. 20% drop over a 10-year period in uh, GDP per working age person. That's dramatic. Uh, then uh, Menem come, came to power, the power of the currency board was instituted. It looked like Argentina was growing quite fast until we got to about 1998. Then another 20 plus, maybe 25% drop in economic activity in the GDP per working age person. And this time over a much shorter period, about half, uh, half the period of, of this drop. Uh, so uh, I, can, I can tell you why I got interested in this work because uh, th there was a um, conference in, uh, in Minneapolis about studying Great Depressions in light of modern uh, macroeconomic theory, and, and my uh, co-author of uh, several papers, Carlos Sarasaga, who's originally Argentine, but uh, he, he, uh, he's a researcher at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Um, we were asked to study the, this Great Depression. And we did, and we came up with some conclusions and so on, and uh, we published our paper. But then we decided to plug in the numbers. Given we had the numbers anyway, we decided to plug in the numbers for, for the 1990s. And we got a big, big surprise. Um, the surprise was we plugged in the numbers into uh, a, a, uh, the model framework that we used to study uh, macroeconomic phenomena calibrated to Argenti Argentine numbers, and the model said, in light of the productivity growth of Argentina, Argentina should have grown, grown much faster. The capital stock should have been substantially bigger by the end of the decade. And just to, to illustrate that, he, here are the data. Now, these, these are not per capita or per working age person. This is total real GDP. Um, so that, I mean, obviously there was population growth so that uh, this per capita drop that you saw, that doesn't show up in the, in the total, uh, total values. Uh, here's the increase over the nine, starting in the 90s up until about 1998 and then this additional drop. What did the model say should have happened? Uh, the model uh, accounts quite well for what happens in the 80s, this bad period. But it says GDP should have grown substantially high, more in the, in the 90s than it did. Uh, the discrepancy is even greater if we look at the capital stock. This is the best measure of the sum of all the capacity to produce in Argentina. The sum of factories, machines, uh, everything. Um, th th these are the data. The model says this should have happened. And in fact, 
this, this uh, extent of growth is over 20% more than actually happened. Uh, now, what could be the reason for that? Uh, Carlos and I like to emphasize, uh, I mean, there, there's never uh, a way to prove anything in economics, but everything is suggestive of the notion that Argentina suffered from what we call the time inconsistency disease. Um, this, this was due to past hyperinflations. The hyperinflation in the 1980s was not the first experienced by Argentina. And people have long memories. So uh, uh, if they have been burnt, burnt once or twice, they're going to be more careful the third time. Uh, it's fair to say that the credibility of Argentina among investors was not, was not high. This is one of the most depressing pictures I've ever seen. I mean, uh, it, it's in the ballpark with the uh, third of the uh, plots I had at the very, very beginning. Uh, this is uh, capital per working age person, um, starting in the 80s. So, so here's the level in uh, about 82. Compare that with 2002, 20 years later. The, uh, capital stock per working age person has dropped by more than 20%. Uh, this, this, is, this is unbelievable almost. And uh, this, would, this would have uh, dramatic implications for the ability for workers to, uh, to have a reasonable income, to have a reasonable wage. Um, people with human capital often do better in uh, bad times such as this than those with less human capital. And, and so uh, uh, this has had the effect of widening the gap between the more well-to-do and the poor in Argentina. The poverty level has risen and so on. Uh, in, uh, in our opinion, it largely because of bad, bad economic policy. Uh, it's true Argentina has recovered some uh, recently. Will, uh, will the gap be closed? Well, uh, it, if, it, if they don't close the gap, then the poor will be poor for, con continue to be poor for a long time. Uh, and, and one of the difficulties, this, this is something that a nation should always be careful about. If you lose your confidence, if you lose the confidence among in investors, it is difficult to restore it, as uh, Argentina discovered evidently in the early 90s. Uh, and, and that's one of the things economists know the least about. I mean, uh, th there is no easy answer. If, uh, if some hotshot young economist come up, comes up with a great answer to that question, for sure, he'll be standing in front of the king of Sweden in uh, 20 or 25 years and re receive, uh, receive the prize. So, but we do, we do know some things. We do know that it's, it's important uh, that policy is geared for the long run. And that's something I discovered. I've been visiting Argentina every year since 1997. And for some reason, after two October 2004, they, uh, they were more willing to listen to me than they uh, used to. Uh, and and uh, I, I would get questions from journalists and so on. What do I think about so-and-so policy initiative? A and these were policy initiatives that uh, were very short run in nature. And uh, I would always say, well, I am not interested in those policies. I want to know what they're doing that would have implications for, for the long run. So here are some uh, lessons for, for policy. Um, and, and I've already touched upon, upon some of them. Um, government policy must be credible and forward-looking. And here's where I would like to mention the example of Ireland. Um, it's kind of idiosyncratic what, 
why I happened to study Argentina. I was at the Dallas Fed and uh, I, I, I started talking with Carlos Sarasaga about interesting issue having issues having to do with with uh, with Argentina and, and it turns out that there's a lot you can learn from Argentina same way about uh, Ireland again at the Dallas Fed they have a um, Irish economist someone born in Ireland Mark Wynn uh, and also I, I at some point I had a uh, Irish student from whom I let learned a lot a lot uh, and uh, anyway Mark Wynn and I decided to uh, to take a look at Ireland, and uh, Ireland is, is is very interesting. You 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 saw the picture. You saw how it kind of followed the uh, some of the slower growing countries in uh, in the European Union for uh, up until uh, about 1990. It was there right in between uh, Greece and Spain, and then it simply took off. What what could be behind such uh, such uh, such an important growth experience. Well, Ireland had already before, 20 years before 1990, they had already uh, decided to make sec secondary education free of charge. Students would not pay uh, school money. Um, by 1990, Ireland found itself with a potentially, uh, well, Quite, it was a well-educated pot uh, potential workforce and potentially highly skilled workforce. But that, that wasn't sufficient to really get a, a gr growth movement started. What did they do? One thing they said, and, and I like to use that example because it's so forward-looking and, and for some reason, credible, uh, Ireland said, if you come to Ar uh, Ireland and you set up a factory here, these will be the tax rates on your income, not just 1992, 93, 94. They gave the, the entire tax schedule all the way to 2009, 20 years into the future. Uh, and these were, uh, relatively uh, low taxes, admittedly rising over time, but everyone knew what they would be. That is, if, you, if Ireland were credible. Now, what it is about Ireland to make, make it credible, I mean, you may wonder why they couldn't pull the same trick that you might, uh, that I described, the, that could result from the time inconsistency disease. Why wouldn't they say 1995? Well, you already, built your factories, we fooled you, we'll, we'll, now we'll tax you. Uh, well, Ireland evidently did not have a history of, uh, of fooling uh, people. They, uh, and ex but exactly what, what we can point to to make it credible, that's hard to say, but it, it, it was credible and they have stuck to, uh, to their policy. Um, now, to avoid the time inconsistency disease, um, sometimes the right institutions are the answer. And I uh, already mentioned the example of, of uh, making the central bank more independent from, from, uh, from political pressure. How, how to come up with the right institution when it comes to fiscal policy is a little more difficult. And, and that's a subject of ongoing research, but it's very important research. Um, as you already saw in my charts, there are large discrepancies across countries in terms of, of income. Uh, and and there, are some, there are some things we know. Low income often is the result of country-specific policies that have the implication of restricting the set of technologies that can be used in that country. It could, it could come about because uh, of um, the influence of vested interests on the politicians. It could be uh, corrupt politicians. It could be because of unrest in the country. 
Um, and again, it's, it's hard to say which, which comes first, the unrest or the lack of economic development. Is it one causing the other or the other way around? It's, it's sometimes hard to tell, but it's got to be they're uh, interrelated somehow. Uh, in this day and age, a lot of knowledge is available. Uh, with modern technology, knowledge flows easily. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that countries could take advantage of, maybe uh, with the help combined with some nation-specific innovative activity. Uh, if, if, they, if they wanted to, growth, ex uh, growth miracles could happen, such as one of the most dramatic is South Korea that grew more than sixfold from 1965 to, uh, to, to 1990. It, it, it's, it's possible. But uh, there's no reason to be, you don't need to be as ambitious as that. Uh, the, the, uh, the poverty in some of these nations is so dramatic uh, that any sort of, uh, at least somewhat, catching up with, uh, with the more well-to-do nations w is likely to, to make life much better in, uh, uh, for, uh, for just about everyone in the, in the nations. The, the a problem, of course, is that in the very short run, it will appear to some groups of the nation that they're going to be hurt by, by the adoption of new, uh, new technologies. Uh, well, in, in principle, they could be compensated, but of course, the long run is, a lo is, is very long. It, it, it's 10, 20, 50 years, and just about everyone will ultimately take advantage uh, of such, such um, uh, benign economic development. Um, I'd like to end with, um, this is uh, obviously a little tongue in cheek. They, uh, this is, this is uh, paraphrasing the ending of a book uh, by my sometimes uh, co-author Edward Prescott, uh, written with Steve Parente. They, they wrote a book on, called Barriers to Riches. Very interesting book, a nice compact book. You might uh, pick it up and take a look. They end this book by saying that with good policy, there is potential in poor nations for not one to two percent, but 1,000 to 2,000 percent income increase. Uh, obviously, they like to add those three zeros to the one to two, but it's, it's, not, it's not so um, far-fetched over some horizon. Remember that if we go back to my pictures, the, the countries that were down to around 500 or less dollars per capita in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in GDP. Remember that the most well-to-do were up around 35 or, or, or 40,000. If you, if, you, if you grow by a thousand percent over a, uh, say, a uh, um, two or three decade period, that would bring you up from 500 to 5,000. That's still not very high, but, but it clearly would be doable. Um, I think I've done pretty well in terms of my time. Did I have I spent my 40 minutes? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and uh, this is really my conclusion. Uh, I, I made the, uh, I think I made the point all along that, and maybe it's, it's mostly my belief, but I, I hope I've convinced you that the, the, this potential connection between economic development and peace is potentially quite important. Yes. of your clear presentation on the global nutrition issue. But my observation and some questions on what you have said so far would be that in mature democratic political institutions, there's much more chance for you to create political stability.
But in political turmoil and in situation of political turmoil and very destabilized situation, election is always at the horizon of the mind of politicians seeking to win. Therefore, the objective function of the government as a player would not be the welfare of the people as such uh, that you have assumed in your model. It would be far more winning the election to come with whatever mean it could, like this, uh, this country in recent years. Plus, the recent election, every political party turned populist in policies direct direction so that they can win this immediate election. Given this type, uh, kind of behavioral framework of government as a player, therefore, what they want to do is to jack up the economic activities so that it looked good prior to the election, so that they can win. And you can always see this inconsistency. Plus, if government changes so frequently, there will be no commitment over time. Why should a new government try to create a consistent policy over the years? Like in the case of Ireland that you mentioned, that they have tax schedule over a long haul. How could they do that if the government have no continuity? and some kind of public commitment that will keep them too. I don't see how it can happen in countries around the world with this exceptional case of Ireland. You may shed some light in helping us pol in political economy. How do you constrain the government apart from the budget so that their behavior in terms of their own well-being could be pushed towards doing things with rule-based issue? That would be my first comment that maybe you care to comment. My second comment would be the issue of delinking the appointment of the governor, a bank, uh, the central bank governor from the government. Can it be done? Would it be healthy in your opinion so that there will be real independence of the central bank so that your Fed is example uh, is not totally delinked. My country, the finance minister could sack the central bank governor, therefore Mandatory policy usually is always, if you want your job, you better make sure you're not contradictory to the government's wish. What would you think about establishing some way so that governor, governor of central bank cannot be appointed or removed by the politician master? Then my next comment would be the issue of targeting. Would you care to comment if I have written an article recently about, apart from inflation ta targeting, what about growth targeting so that it's clear in the mind of the investors where we're heading? What about current account deficit balance targeting so that you have more, even more rule-based issue apart from just inflation, for example? Would that do, in your opinion, um, on your research, can we target a few more things so that we declare it, commit it to, to the public what we would like to do in the future? And lastly, I would like to ask you the question I about... I need a list. <laughs> uh, Long-term institutional building. What do you suggest if you can have a clean sheet for that you can wave your magic wand? What can we do so that we can create long-term institutional capacity building so that they will be more conducive for the kind of thing you're advocating for rule-based economic policy. If you could do, have it your way, how do you architecturally create it in the in economy like, like developing economy like Thailand? I guess I asked too many questions, but if it's <laughs> all related to what you have said, and possibly that would be helpful to us to pr provoke you to answer. Uh, Uber, do I have 40 more minutes? <laughs> um, so on the, on the first question, I sort of alluded to, uh, to that difficulty. I said, here I'll uh, abstract from the additional complication that comes about because uh, at least in some countries when a new uh, 
administration comes to power, then, then uh, the objective might even change. So, so I wanted to emphasize that this, this is a complication even if we, uh, if we um, abstract it from, from that complication. And that's, that just emphasizes how important it, it is to think about how to, uh, to generate continuity over time in, uh, in governments. You're probably right that it's, it's easier in some countries than in others. In, uh, in Norway, for example, I'm, uh, I'm more familiar with, with Norway than Thailand. In Norway, the government changes every four or eight years, uh, typically. Uh, one, uh, and if they do, then it's between the Labour government or the lab Labour Party on the one hand and, uh, and a coalition of parties more towards the right on the other, on, on the other hand. Amazingly, the large picture doesn't change. Norway has this oil fund, for example, that's being accumulated. It's, uh, uh, so far, it's up to one times uh, annual GDP and it's projected to be up to uh, grow to five times annual GDP by uh, 2020. Uh, Norway has agreed on a decision rule for how to spend uh, the oil fund. They have decided the oil fund is to be saved primarily for future generations. C continually, they're under pressure from uh, different uh, sides to, to spend more of the oil fund. Oh, there are long queues in the hospitals. There are the we need to spend more on education. All sides of the, uh, of the government has stuck by the decision rule. It, it's a very transparent decision rule and, and everyone could tell if they, if they, uh, if they deviated from it. From it. So uh, transparency obviously would be, uh, would be a good thing, but no, but no guarantee. Um, I don't pretend to have the answers for the whole spectrum of countries. Well, what I tried to do was just emphasize it, it, how important it is to think about these issues and, and what, what can you do to, uh, to set up institutions to facilitate uh, rules or uh, a, a credible environment that would foster longer run development. Now your second question, oh, now I've uh, forgot, a, a, key, a key word to remind me. How do you link the, the political influence over appointment and removal of central bank governors? Oh, yeah, so. Uh, it's, it's linked somehow. Uh, yes, and, and more so in some countries than in others. Sure. In, in, uh, in Argentina, with which I'm familiar, uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of this uh, last uh, depression, the head of the central bank was, uh, there, were, there was a year when uh, the central bank head was sacked, I mean, a new one uh, every time, was sacked six times in a year. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> a, and in fact, I saw an ama amazing figure that suggested that the central bank head in Argentina over the past 20 or 30 years has changed more than once a year. Uh, so, so, so uh, now this just emphasizes how important this issue is because in Argentina, you saw how badly things have, have gone in Argentina. So it, it's something to really put your mind to and, and try to uh, think about solutions. And, and, and this would seem to be a case where the solution is quite easy. I mean, you just, uh, you just decide that, okay, not from now on, the, the central bank is to be independent. And uh, uh, that's no guarantee because you need a capable head or a capable govern governance, uh, of course. But, uh, but uh, I'm sure in Thailand, such, such a head would not be difficult to find. Um, the third, Let's see. So the third one. Instead of just in place and targeting, could we target oh. something else as well, like growth targeting, current. But that's what uh, that's what uh, Ireland did, for example, using their tax policy. I don't think inflation policy is effective at all in uh, in targeting growth. I mean, it's it's uh, 
It's effective in the sense that I if, if, the nation, if the nation's decision makers feel confident that the, uh, that the, go that the, that the government is committed, I mean it's usually through the central bank, is committed to a low inflation environment. That is positive for growth. Um, so I'm not sure what, what it, beyond that, uh, I, I don't think there's much the central bank uh, could do. Uh, if, if they follow that prescription, then they're doing their job as far as, uh, as an environment for growth. Uh, beyond that, uh, what the government can do uh, towards growth uh, comes primarily through their fiscal policy. And, and, and that's what, uh, what Ireland did. Uh, and it turned out to be so successful. And your fourth? Is the long-term institutional uh, architecture that would create your rule based constituency that would force the government not to be discretionary? Uh, well, uh, that's, that's, a, um, that's a difficult question to answer because, and that's, you could say that that's a question of ongoing research. Uh, uh, it's not going to be easy to, to think of such solutions of such institutions, especially as they apply to fiscal policy. Um, but, but, it, but they're very, very important questions. And uh, uh, off the top of it, there's no way I can stand here and, and give you, give, give you the, the, the structure uh, of such institutions. All, I, all I've tried to do is emphasize how important that issue is. A and I'm giving you examples. I gave you that g example from Norway. I, uh, I was um, in, 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 oct in October, I was at a conference in uh, Costa Rica on, uh, uh, arranged by Copenhagen Consensus. They, they, um, there's this organization that uh, they come together they bring together uh, panelists every now and then to think about what you can do to improve the situation either in the world. They had a, such a conference in 2004 and they'll have another one uh, in May of this year. Uh, but the particular one I went, a, a, and the kind of question they ask is, suppose you have $50 billion to, to spend on whatever project. How would, and there are these uh, 50 alternatives. How would you rank them? And they have uh, experts doing cost-benefit analysis, et cetera, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, a mixture of uh, Nobel laureates and other economists and other political scientists get together uh, to rank them. I was at the, uh, uh, the conference in Costa Rica, uh, covered only Latin America, and, and Latin America is it's not just Argentina, but you can find uh, so many countries that are doing poorly and then sprinkled in between are countries that are doing much better. Chile is, is an example. And it turns out their constitution is set up in such a way as to uh, make it less likely that inconsistent behavior will prevail. Um, I, I once, I, in, in that panel I asked that the expert who, who presented the case for, uh, for different kinds of constitutions. And I said, well, uh, I picked the constitution that uh, the constitutional setup that looked most promising. And I said, I is that the kind of constitution that would, for example, uh, deal with the uh, oil fund in Norway the way uh, no the Norwegian government has done? And he said, yes, ex that's exactly the case. In uh, Chile has a copper fund, which in maybe not in size, but in many ways is analogous to the Norwegian oil fund. And he said, under this constitution, uh, no one would ever touch the, uh, the, uh, uh, this copper fund. But if it were the Argentine constitution, it'd be gone in, in a minute.
I think your talk is very uh, provocative and uh, you have given us insight into economic development. I look at the title you said, uh, Peace and Economic Development in the Age of Globalization. I, I'd like to add a few remarks to the debate that you and Dr. Greg Zak have been talking. In my view, I think peace is a prerequisite of economic development. In ASEAN, we used to have a lot of war you know, among countries. But when we started ASEAN, no more war. And the period of peace has brought us prosperity. So in a way, peace is a period to economic development. I think you are, you are, your view is also correct. The deficiency in economic development is not good for peace. I, I also agree with that. But uh, in terms of economic development, I have given a lot of thought to it. I think there cannot be one size fit all policy to any country, you know, when you want to develop its economy. For example, you, you are giving a lot of uh, uh, importance to technological change and innovation. That can be applied very easily with developed countries and also middle income. But for a country in Africa, where they are at a very low level, you know, of development, it's difficult to expect them to have, you know, innovation and technological change. In my view, economic development can come mainly from institutional reform. Institutional reform uh, would bring good governance and also rule-based law, and uh, the people would think in terms of uh, no conflict of interest. Then, if you have good institutions in the countries, and also peace, of course, uh, then uh, the economic policy that come out will be good because people will not think about themselves, will not think about their own gains, they will think about their policy. So, so I think this, but, but other factors are also important, you know, like productivity, innovations, technological change, capital input, how you train labor, education, health, all sort of things that you can bring in when you want to enhance economic development. But another thing that I'd like to, to say is that when you talk about economic development in the age of globalization, I think we cannot leave globalization out. We, we are talking about uh, internal policy, you know, mainly today. But globalization means international rules. There are rules in international landscape, for example, in, at the WTO, and also uh, the, the a little bit unbalanced power between developed and developing country. For example, in the trade in agriculture, you, 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 will, you will see that uh, uh, the developed country, the EU, and also the United States, they still practice subsidies in agriculture, which is not good for developing countries who depend mainly on agriculture export. So I feel that for the globalization to be good to the European country, we must look into all these laws, uh, regulation that are detrimental to European countries. I think the book by Stiglitz is also very good. He talked a lot about, about all these rules and I, I concur with him that we will have to facilitate to make international rules that would be good, that would help development. Finally, I would say different country has its own problems. Thailand has its own problems. The other have their own problem in Africa. So we would have to look at the symptom just like a patient. Then we will come out with good policy. But first, it must be healthy. It must have peace and it must have good value. In Thailand, you know, institution must be good. Thank you. Excuse me, may I interrupt? Uh, for, the, for the criticism, probably we can have like a, a talk after this, after the talk, okay? And uh, we have enough time only for one question okay. because we'd like to okay. finish yes. by 4 p.m. May I? Okay, as okay, the topic, the peace and... Well, could I... So no, there's not, not much I could okay. comment on. Uh, I mean, you bring up some very valid po points. The only thing I wanted to say is that 
Um, when, I, when I said talk about the role of innovation, I don't know, remember I said there's a lot of knowledge available. So I didn't necessarily mean that these countries would do all the innovative activities themselves. There's, uh, and I suppose that's where globalization comes in very powerfully because now you can, you can uh, import knowledge from all over the world, possibly combined with country-specific innovative activity to, to make it applicable to your country. Now, that could apply not just to, uh, to, to being able to produce um, output efficiently in factories, but even, even uh, things like uh, knowledge about types of uh, seeds to use to, to make agriculture more efficient while the economy is, uh, is, is building up from, uh, from a low level. Uh, but in general, I, uh, I, I, mean I, I obviously I support some, many of your the points you bring up also about the uh, the role, uh, the, the bad role some countries' uh, subsidy policy could have on on, on, the, on the rest of the world. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. May yeah. I one have one question, opinion? please. Yes. It's a very good. Would you please? Yes. Uh, to attend here peace and economic uh, development in the age of the globalization, uh, I have a see and uh, just a uh, uh, two or three minutes. Uh, first of all, I think in the world globalization should be escaped from the military fighting. Okay. The second is the is this possible because you are noble in economics. Uh, uh, is it possible for the Asia bond to Asia dollar because euro we have it. Okay, the the second one is sheer dollars. How do you think it? And uh, third is uh, many of the macro in economic development. Uh, I have a see about the. Mm, I have a note, but uh, is this is the the graph canal. The graph canal is a uh, two or three days uh, from the Russia to uh, the east to the Euro, not plus not only plus to the Sumatra channel. Is this possible or not? Uh, I think I should be uh, help all these two or three points like that. Uh, I apologize. I I guess your microphone was kind of blurry. I, I had trouble picking up your. Uh, oh, first is uh, is it possible for the Asia bond to Asia dollar? The second is the graph. for what? Asia dollar. Asia dollar. Oh, to, to have an Asian dollar? No. Yeah, Euro dollar, okay. We have it. Asia dollar, is it possible? How do you think? Okay, the second is the, the graph canal. We have, a, okay, uh, the Panama and the Suez and the graph canal, is it possible? Okay, only two topics in the future or the next seminar. Okay, thank uh, you. If I understood the questions right, I'm not sure I'm the right person to uh, try to answer them, but it, it's possible I, I simply misunderstood. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, probably we are, I'm sorry to interrupt, we can continue the discussion uh, after the talk when we have the reception out there, okay, and everyone is welcomed after this. So, uh, on behalf of the, uh, of the organizer, I would like to express my sincere thanks for uh, this great lecture. Uh, more or less, we realize how economic policy plays a significant role in developing countries. How it brings the poor nations of the world closer economically to the world to do ones. And on this auspicious moment, could I have the honor of the president of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, Associate Professor Dr. Tirade Usawat, to give a token of appreciation to Professor Kitlin. Okay. Uh, on the stage, please. Thank you very much. And here comes the last part. Professor Kitlin, Mr. Moraves, distinguished guests, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce administrators, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizers, 
International Peace Foundation, Bridges, and the University of Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I express our sincere thanks for your active participation to this special lecture. I also wish to extend my gratitude to all the sponsors of this event, BMW Lucid Hotel Ogilvy and Thai Airways, for without their big support, this second special speech will not be possible. And we would love all participants to enjoy the reception after this special moment, and you can have a chance to probably uh, to chat with uh, Professor Kitland after this. And before you have the safe trip home, we'd like to call you back for our third event in early March. So we'd like you to be here again. Thank you very much. And the organizer would love to have the group picture with Professor Kitland uh, in the front. The group picture in the front, please. Professor Kitlan, Mr. Uwe, and the guests. <laughs> Dr. Sawani, uh, the president.